I have a lot. I have a lot to say, and I'm going to apologize in advance if Maureen needs to cut me off at the end. But I will try to get there. I'm I'm reprising really my career here, uh, starting off with energy momentum mapping in the very beginning. Um, but but right but pretty close to the beginning, I run into interpretive difficulties. You know what's what's going on with the with the small particles in a, in a momentum resolved experiment, for instance. Later on, and now in, in, in the time going forward, we're finding that the boundaries are becoming more and more important to the behavior of nanoscale objects. So I wanna say something like that on that. And, and I think that we ought also to go forward a little bit quicker in, in looking at, at time and space in our experimental uh, work. Um, so this is, this is the state of, of what I saw as a beginning graduate student at Cornell. It was an, an old Hitachi HU11A at 75 kilovolts, and it did basically angle resolved work um, at 15 eight volts of AC on the high voltage um, and one micron spot at the specimen and eight but an eight micro radian angular resolution. So, so we could get pictures like this. This is work by Roger Vincent and John Silcox um, in, uh, in 1973. And we're looking at very, very close to what we call the, the velocity of light line here. So a surface plasmon comes from short wavelengths out in and into the longer wavelengths and bumps up against the light line. The light line then splits the dispersion into a radiated loss, which is inside the light cone, and, and a non-radiated loss, which is a surface plasmon that we know. And we have two branches because of the, the thin specimen. So this is really, really interesting to me because it, because it makes contact um, in the long run to ideas that are currently being developed in quantum gravity. And I'm not gonna say anything more about that, but just to give you the, the, the hook here is that there's a relationship between what we were doing in 1970 in surface plasmons that relates to the modern quantum science of gravity. Uh, this is my thesis work. Uh, the, the interest was in getting a detailed look at the bulk plasmon dispersion. Um, and it was, it, it was hard to do this uh, in, in the using photographic image plates because it's hard to measure the intensities accurately enough in order to sort out the difference between a, a single bulk plasmon here, uh, a phonon here, a phonon plus a, a, an integrated plasmon, a phonon plus two integrated plasmons, doubles plasmon scattering. We can also, that's if you look at the back focal plane in the microscope, if you look at the image plane, of course, we get a slit across the bottom. There's, there's a crack in the specimen and we see integrated 15 volt plasmons as we go up in energy here. So, so my job was to bring the computer, the computer to, the, to the table here. And so the, this is a PDP-11 machine around about 1972 or so. We had uh, 15K of memory and a one megabyte disk. Um, so, we, so we set up a photomultiplier down here in a scintillator to catch electrons coming out of the wing filter spectrometer. Um, and, and then to, to go into a, a, a piece of electronics that I built that interfaces with the computer. And this is the result. Um, we get very, I can get very accurate data out of this. Uh, this is a, a subtraction of an integrated spectrum that shows the, the phonon plus plasmon scattering. And it shows a, a, a large angle scattering that shows a plasmon, that, that, which is the phonon plus plasmon stuff. And the question is, is what, what is the bulk plasmon only look like at this angle? And I, the way I got there was by normalizing the multiple scattering image results 
and subtracting, getting this dotted line here, which shows the true peak of the bulk plasmon versus the, the composite, which was the surface plasmon plus phonon plus belt plasmon here. So I could go then and what I could, I could strip out the phonon stuff. So now this is all plasmon scattering, multiple scattering. There's a 220G here that gives a, another interference term, which, which is easy to get rid of. And then I do a log deconvolution of a, of a cylinder uh, and in angle and, and the length of the cylinder in energy to get the single scattering. So what I found remarkable about this is now I could get data that the condensed matter physicist wanted, which is the dispersion of the bulk plasmon as a function of angle. Um, but I also found a new thing uh, that, that John Spence had, had thought about earlier in time. And that's that there's a little bit of, of multiple scattering, which is left over when you correct to make single scattering. So this looks like a single vertex two plasmon scattering. It's got a zero intensity at the, at the origin at, at zero angle. It has a dispersion, which is the convolution of two bulk plasmons, but the width is the same as the, as the two bulk plasmons. It's not, it's not a convolution of the widths. So this is not a multiple scattering, but a single vertex event. Um, I had the, a lot of luck, I think, to, to be associated with John Silcox, who was my thesis advisor, because, because uh, he knew a lot of people in Cambridge. And so I ended up there at the Cavendish doing postdoc. Um, and the, these are a set of people who I would say influenced me over, over the years. Alan Craven, John Chapman was my supervisor at, at, in Cambridge. Uh, Roger Vincent was a, was a postdoc at Cornell when I became a graduate student. And then of course, you've got Mick Brown and Archie Howey, and, and of course the, the Peter Hirsch. So what was I doing there? Um, I had computers on my mind. I came to a lab where there were no computers uh, except a desktop and an EDX X-ray detector. So I said, okay, an EDX machine has got a computer in it. So I, I, I pulled out a soldering iron and I opened up the machine and people were looking at me strangely, but they let me do it. Um, and, I, and I hooked up, I lashed up a way to get pulse counting out of the EELS detector to, to aperture the scan voltage for the EELS energy to create a pulse whose height dependent on the EELS event. Uh, and then that went right into the EDX machine to create a digital spectrum. Then you could do things like subtract the background, you could multiply by, uh, by, a, by an energy term to get wave vector heat, to get a, 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 a background that you can work with, uh, convert, it, convert the energy scale to momentum. And so now this is the extended, uh, the, the EELS extended electron fine structure and, uh, and uh, smooth it, do the, do the Fourier transform on the desktop calculator in the next room and discover that if you evaporate my, uh, carbon on mica, you'll get uh, one R radial distribution function. And if you evaporate it on KCL, you get another. And so this was being able to do all of this with eels was new to our to our work in in 1979. And Fizrev letter were, were interested in, in in carrying that. So after after Cambridge, um, I I went to IBM, and during the first few years we were waiting for delivery of a, of a VG stem. So I spent that, I spent a couple of months, a few months up at Cornell, uh, working with an HB501 at the Submicron facility. And so what I was interested in were, were puzzles to me uh, for, for how people viewed 
what was happening in an, ex in an electron scattering experiment. The physics community was, of course, working in angle resolve mode, momentum and energy. And when they then looked at small particles with a broad beam, um, they discovered that there were, they could not see any bulk plasma at omega p here. P here is very is nothing. They lots, saw lots of surface scattering, and they began to get the idea that because these particles were small, they were surface dominated. Um, but we we knew for the, with the few experiments that we'd done that if you have a very small electron beam and you run it down through the particle, you'll get bulk, you will see bulk scattering. And this is background carbon bulk plasmon, but you don't see much surface. So what's going on here? Um, I, I did a, another experiment that, so I, I did a line scan across a small aluminum particle at the, and mapped at the bulk plasmon energy. And I found that there was lots of bulk scattering there and that it acted like a local fit thickness me measurement. So the intensity that we see here is we can approximate by a multiple scattering. So it goes like the, the thickness, the, the local thickness times the exponential of, of the thickness over the mean free path for the plasmon. Um, on the other hand, for the surface loss at seven, uh, you, you get the, the, uh, the dip in the middle and the peaks come at the edges. And the curves that, that fit that behavior is, is uh, basically one over cosine of the angle of the trajectory of the electron with the local normal of, of, the, of the sphere. Um, and I thought, this is great, I'll publish. But, but PRO didn't, was not amused. It looked too simple to them. So this went in the drawer. And later, uh, Rich, uh, Rufus Ritchie and Archie Howie picked it up and using similar ideas were, were able to publish in Field Mag. So what, we've, what we're discovering here is that what matters is the geometry of the surface and the bulk in the region of the probe. Very, very logical and very straightforward. Um, gets a little bit more uh, complicated if we try to get more information. So here I thought, okay, let me look at the bulk plasmon scattering intensity as a function of the sphere diameter. And in, in general, it's linear with undulations which, are, which have to do with the weight potential that trails the fast electron interacting with the top and the bottom surfaces. I'll just go briefly there to, to, uh, to remind you what I mean by the plasmon wake. So there's a the fast electron going half the speed of light and then uh, the hydrodynamic wake behind, behind the electron uh, that is going about 100 times the Fermi velocity and this is just like the wake that you see behind a boat on the, on the water. So, so I got impatient because it was taking a long time. And I decided to adjust the optics of the microscope to get more current. And the structure changed. And then I, I continued on with that. I pushed a little bit further. And I, and I saw these deep undulations here at a shorter wavelength. And frankly, the only, the only reason that I can come up with as to why that might happen is that when I, when I weakened the condenser lenses, I injected a lot of spherical aberration into the probe. So the probe itself has wings on it for this case. And those wings must be interacting with the lateral surfaces of the particle. So that's... So at that point, I'm, I'm thinking there is a lot of quantum information here and the information uh, is relying on the positions of subsidiary maxima in the probe. So this is a, to me was, was saying that the phase is important in the scattering. At the time, 
uh, in the 1980s, 1990s, um, we, it was generally agreed that, that inelastic scattering destroyed the phase information. But what, I'm, what I think I was beginning to find here is that no, the phase information remains and might be usable down the road. So I've talked about the plasmon wake, and I don't think there's anything new about that now. Um, so the next thing that I, object I looked at was a two particle system. Um, so this is a small, small aluminum sphere on a large aluminum sphere. Uh, the electron beam is in an aloof mode. I was calling it global at the time because what's happening here relies on interactions among two, par two particles. Uh, and the electron beam is remote from the particles. It's not necessarily going through it. Through it. And what I found was that the, the 7 EV surface plasmon that you see on the large sphere became 4 EV when the, when the electron beam was either off the edge of the small particle or in the region of the small particle. So what's going on here? Um, what I did actually was to, was to realize that this was a bispherical system. So I could solve the boundary value operations, the conditions to create, uh, to solve for the energy given the dielectric functions for the metal aluminum and the aluminum oxide that sits between the, par the two particles. And I could look up the solutions because they're, they're tabulated. So I could see that if I had a 7 EV plasmon, surface plasmon for a sphere, then in the bispherical case, I would see couple, coupling between the two spheres and giving a, a, a difference frequency of about four electron volts. So that was very satisfying. I couldn't publish the image because, because PRL wasn't able to publish images then. So the images had to come later in surface science and in ultramicroscopy. So, so by that time, the, uh, the, the microscope has arrived at IBM and I had some small changes I wanted to make in it. Um, I wanted a new spectrometer for high resolution. So we built a spectrometer. I wanted to, I wanted a better probe size and I had for various reasons suspected that this was actually a 120 kilovolt machine. So I converted it to that. So that took me from a, from a delivery probe of about, about, um, about three, two and a half to three angstroms to about two, two angstroms. Uh, I needed better, better detection efficiency. So, this, so the CCD detector went up on the top. Um, I got an eels accuracy of about 20 milli electron volts. This is, this is something that we've neglected over the years. This is in fact, as far as I know, the only existing machine that can, that can dial in uh, 500.105 and get within 23 milli electron volts of the correct energy. And it's been very important over the years to the work that, that I've been able to do. Um, along about 1999, I also got together with Peter Cruitt and, uh, and Willem Mook to do a monochrometer that was a 60 millivolt device. This worked, but it collided in, in the installation with the aberration correction that came in, in 1999 with Andre and Nicholas. Um, so that's the way the machine looks physically. The only really big difference from the delivered machine, except for the spectrometer, is, an, is a huge ion pump that, that let me travel without having to fill the liquid nitrogen doer. Um, a lot of computer work with the, with the, uh, with, with the panel. Uh, I digitized as much of the panel as possible so that I could reproduce things like, like the, the conditions going back and forth between the conditions for eels and, and imaging. Um, I replaced uh, the dis display here with a, an IBM device that's 3840 by 2400 pixels. 
uh, is beautiful. It's the only display that I've found that actually beats the, the uh, spatial resolution that you can get on the old displays, but is compatible, of course, with the, with the computation. Um, so the first thing that I had, I had promised in my job interview that I would look at defects and figure out the energetics for them. So my first try here was for the band gap in uh, gallium arsenide, gallium indium arsenide, and looking at the interface to see whether there was a defect there that had a different energy. So this is the, the kind of the boilerplate here. The, data, the dots are data. The, the line is the simulation of a, of a field emission source distribution with the appropriate broadening for uh, having to do with the spectrometer. Um, and, th and then out at the tail out here, we begin to see the direct interband scattering of the gap that's at 1.42 uh, electron volts. Um, so we don't have any atoms columns here because the machine is still more than two angstroms, kind of two and a half angstroms here. Um, but I can see the, in a bright field image, the interface between the two materials and a misfit dislocation. It's interesting that uh, this, this, this experiment taught me something about the material science uh, because the, the, uh, the, we have a very small probe. What happens when you cross the boundary here? Well, it, right at that boundary area, the atoms are sticking together because their short range potentials are very similar. And you'll see that in a moment. When we when we when we talk about the the scattering in, from the the state in the gap at the dislocation, but what I can but I could go into the gallium arsenide bulk and get the one point four two, and I could go into the gallium indium arsenide at fifteen percent here, and get one point twenty eight, and then when I put the probe on the misfit dislocation, it dropped to one point oh eight. Very, very, very easy to see, but a lot of statistical problems due to the, to the length of the field emission tail. So what are we looking at here? Um, first of all, in the bulk where you've got nowhere else to go, you do see the direct gap. But when you're looking at the defect, if there's a defect state there, that stays localized, so it, it, it produces a flat band that covers the whole of the Brion zone. So the scattering that you see in this experiment is from the fill state of the flat band out to the L Valley out near the zone, out near the, the Brion zone edge. And that's the 1.08 that we're measuring. So the gap, so the state exists about 0.63 above the valence band edge in the middle of the gap. So that was hard work. That was, I was, I didn't have a CCD detector for that. And so I was counting, direct, direct counting. So I got good, good accuracies, um, but I had to count for a long, long time and frankly, if I didn't have the ability to dial in the uh, a pass energy for the wean filter and have it stay constant, I would not be able to do this work. Um, so it's a lot easier at the silicon 2p3 halves absorption because the intensity is higher than the direct interband scattering uh, and, the, and the background is lower. Um, and so what I'm doing here, I've got three curves for three different specimens done on different days. And you can, so that's show your, I'm showing you some the reproduce, reproducibility that I'm able to get with this instrumentation. Um, I'm modeling the shape with piecewise by density of states curves that are, that have this shape over here. It's a square root of energy at the bottom and then it goes linearly to zero at some top point where things become not dipole forbidden. Um, and I, in, in, in addition, I'm adding a core exciton enhancement 
called a, 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 a Sommerfeld factor, uh, which, it, which goes to one at large energies behind the, behind the onset, but then peaks up at the onset edge. And if the core whole interaction is strong enough, uh, would produce also a bound state. But in silicon, you don't see the bound state, you just see the distortion from the ground state DOS into the excited state that has the core hole present. Now, the reason that, uh, that, that I'm explaining this at length is that, is that this result is different from what you get with X-ray absorption spectroscopy because there's a photon only in that, in that process. So the core hole interaction is stronger and then, and then you get uh, a curve here, which is, which is distorted from, from what the yields is and, and further distorted from the, from the ground state DOS. In the case of our scattering with an electron, the electron actually, even though it's going half the speed of light, has a significant amount of time within the orbit of the Wannier core hole exciton to shift the exciton's energy and to change the Sommerfeld factor. So I've had to make this kind of a, a correction with all of the core edges that I've that I've looked at that are that that have a, a, a screening which which favors the ability of the electron to, to impose its presence on the, within the core exciton orbit. So, so what, do I did, what did I do with that right away? I said, okay, what happens to that edge when we get into a small area? We, we have a, if I have a piece of broken silicon with, a, with an edge that's roughly parallel to the beam trajectory, um, I can move the beam around and move up to the edge. And what I find is that, is, is that I get this, the, the canonical silicon uh, delta L and L3 peaks uh, until I get down to about one nanometer to the, to the edge. And when I get to a half a nanometer, I really clearly are losing the fine structure and the edge shape is damped it's there's a tail on it to lower energies if i do this in a specimen that is that is a wedge shaped so that as i move the probe the, the longitudinal thickness along the beam gets bigger and smaller a similar thing happens the fine structure begins begins to attenuate but the length scale is about 20 nanometers instead of a half a nanometer so again, and again, it broadens out when it gets to the very thin regions. So this, this is a warning to be careful about the, the volume size of the thing that you want to probe with this technique, because you have an interaction which is not, not to first order related to the, to the, to the object. Here, the object, the object, features don't shift, but they change their, their coupling to the beam because of the presence of the top and the bottom and the left and the right surfaces. So, so we're back to this, this plasmon thing, this, this, uh, uh, um, uh, this hydrodynamic wake, which is following the fast electron. And the way to think about this is to realize if you just place an electron in the bulk, it will push other bulk electrons away. We call that the correlation hole. If we move the probe, the, the probe electron, the correlation hole will move with it unless we move too fast. And we're going at a hundred times the Fermi velocity. So what happens is we is this correlation hole extends out in back of the electron and then it collapses and you get a and you get a higher density here a lower density here it's it's exactly analogous to a hydrodynamic wake on on water so the core exciton actually sees this the final state of the core exciton spreads out into this elongated region 
And the final state then interacts with the surfaces at the top and the bottom or the left and the right with the left and the right um, radius being the Thomas Fermi screening length, which is the five angstroms here. And with the, with the length being half of the wavelength of the bulk plasma. So now we go to a real object. Here's a 35 by 70 angstrom silicon wire here or, 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 uh, 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 or, or cylindrical object, <laughs> sorry. Um, and what you can see are, are two effects. One is that, is that in, a, in a sphere, in a silicon sphere, with the measurements we took show that the, that the conduction band edge becomes quantized and it goes to, to higher energies. But also we lose the fine structure uh, as we get below about 50 angstroms in size. And so we, we can plot that up and we find that the, the, the position goes like one over R squared. And this apparently is, is what everybody expected. If we're looking at a, at a finger, at a cylinder, uh, it, the, the effect is weaker. And, you, 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 and that's the, re, the red result here. Um, in terms of the of of the of the carriers hitting the surfaces in this object, producing this long damping tail, um, you can you can see that that goes like one over R, and that's the that's what happens in in terms of 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 electrons at the Fermi velocity, uh, uh, bouncing off the surfaces and losing their coherence with the plasmon uh, so as to, or, the, or in this case, the final state conduction bands and producing a damping term. So in doing these experiments, again, I, the, the warning is that, is that you might be looking at a quantity which is important to a carrier, or you might only be looking at a quantity which is characterizing the energy and velocity of your probe. And it's up to the, the experimentalists to, to figure out which, which one it is. So uh, I went too fast here. Um, this is now a, a practical example, wanting to measure the band offset for a strained silicon quantum well in germanium silicon. So this is a 30% germanium substrate, which is gradually changed in composition to prevent uh, misfit dislocations at the bottom of the, of the strain quantum well, the silicon quantum well. And then, and then the composition is ramped up rapidly at the top surface to create a channel for carriers next to the top, the top surface of the well. Um, as you can see, the band offset with the with by 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 referencing the edges of this of the two p three halves core edge uh, follows the composition in the area where it's relaxed up at up at the top of the well where 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 you want an abrupt transition um, the composition didn't make it there the, there's got they've got germanium in the in the well and silicon. Uh, in the germanium, more too much silicon in the germanium silicon up here. But strangely, the, the transition from the strained quantum well to the unstrained germanium silicon is sharp. And it's as sharp as I could measure it. Um, and it's, it's, this seems weird until you think about the plight of a germanium atom in a, in a population of silicon atoms. The, the potential outside the germanium is almost like silicon. It's like the gallium arsenide, gallium indium arsenide case in that the short range forces for the germanium and silicon are very similar. So they mix well. And what that means is also is that if you have a, if you have a, a body of silicon atoms and you put a single germanium in, you won't necessarily see it in the electronic structure. It will behave like a silicon atom, and I'm I'm reminded of the of the uh, phone home uh, e extra ET terrestrial sitting in the 
sitting in the, the, the closet with all of the other toys and, 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 the, and the protagonist in the movie looking in there and not even seeing the alien in our midst because it looks too much like its neighbors. So th these ideas that, that I've been having over the years from these experiments, touching on coherence and on interaction at a distance with the, with the surfaces, um, non-local uh, um, excitation, those sorts of things, led me to try an experiment in the 1990s that was a, that's too complicated to explain here. But it's a channeling experiment. These are dispersion curves that Archie Howick introduced uh, to characterize the behavior for channeling conditions. And you can go inside and outside of channeling conditions. And under a certain thickness, which is about the uh, half of the extinction distance for, or, or one extinction distance, now, I, now I'm, I'm losing that one, that number. Um, gives you a channeling a, a channeling wave that's either on the on an atom column or off an atom column halfway through the foil so you can use the top half of the foil to produce a channeled wave and you can then interact inelastically with with some excitation like a bulk plasmon or or an interband transition uh, and then you can use the bottom half as a as a crystal grading to, to, give, to give a channeling sensitivity to the collector. And what I did, did here is I reformulated Fermi's golden rule to emphasize symmetry. So in, 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 uh, for the bulk plasmon, these operators row here, which you can look up in Pines and Nauseae, um, are symmetric. They're the minus Q and plus Q are equal. Uh, for uh, a, an object that's left-right symmetric. And if it's left-right anti-symmetric, like an interband transition, then they'll be opposite in sign. So what that means is that depending on, on, your, on how you put the probe in or look at, or, or in which direction you look with the collector, you can optimize to see only the, only the bulk plasmon or only the interband scattering. And I, I was just blown away when I found, when I figured out that I could, in fact, simulate an optical model. And, and, it, and what I see in the experiment is, has the right features for this interpretation to be correct. Um, you can do another experiment, even without aberration correction, uh, that does not need channeling, but you need an object that's small. So I tried this. This is this is a uh, this this diagram came from Helmut Kohl and, and Harold Rosa, um, and what what and what they're saying is that if you have an optical system that makes a small probe, you can use a small collector, and get coherent behavior depending on whether the collector has has is a large or a small aperture, but the condition must be that the oscillations in the specimen are short ranged. So the ideal object for this, to try this experiment is the excels. It's an, in, it's an interference term between the core electron and one atom and its neighbor. And that's all there is, it's not long ranged. So I tried this and darn if it doesn't work. Um, so this is the XL signal for the small collector on axis with a, a VGHB5 probe, about two and a half or three angstroms. And I see all of, this, all of the excels, both the A axis here and the C axis distances here. But when I use a large collector, um, the, I lose the contrast for the A axis. So you see it drops to zero. And this is equivalent to the to, uh, I think, a high resolution experiment, but I've only been trying to explain this in this way for the past few days. So if I get something backwards, I beg, I beg you to figure it out and, and indulge me or, or, or 
or call me up and tell me what I got wrong here. Um, so here's another a more standard object. This is uh, um, a misfit dislocation of germanium silicon silicon interface. And um, I'm, I'm gonna go, have to go a little bit quicker here. Um, what I was interested here is, is whether or not there were, were defect states at the partial dislocations at the 30 and the 90 degree partials. And indeed there are, you can see that in the, in the red here. But also you see a doubling when the beam is on the intrinsic stacking fault here of the a doubling of the L3 peak. And it turns out that what's going on here is that when you take the chair structure in the bulk and flip around the, the third neighbor to, to here, you'll make a boat structure. And these two atoms then interact as, as coupled simple harmonic oscillators and split the LP in the 111 direction. So I was quite enthusiastic about that. I, I really like it when when you when simple simple models can teach you something about about a, a spectrum which lo really looks complicated. So this is what drove me to aberration correction was that was that uh, David Vanderbilt at, at uh, Rutgers had a really nice model for the structure for the ninety degree partial, but I couldn't resolve it. So it was it was only in a nick of time that Nicholas Delby and Andre Krivenik arrived with an aberration corrector. And, and this, this result going from 2.2 plus angstroms to sub angstrom didn't happen overnight. There was a huge amount of effort in cleaning up noise sources in the, in the microscope, which after all was only a, a one nanometer machine or a five angstrom machine when it was delivered. Um, but eventually we got there. And this is the kind of thing that I saw that I just was, became really enamored of. Um, we see all the atoms because the camp contrast is high. This is gold, <coughs> small, small particle, large particle, and then coalescence. And what's going on here is the same thing that was going on with the bispherical system of aluminum. The electron is, fast electron is moving past it. It polarizes the object, makes a big field in between, and that provides a force that pulls the two particles together. Um, it turns out that this is also a, a surface, and surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy uh, mechanism. Um, more more uh, uh, to the point, uh, this is a, a sample that uh, Andre Mikoyan was interested in. Uh, can you see the, dir the direction that the nitrogen atom points? The polarator, the polarity, and at 0.8 angstroms, we can indeed do that. Um, this was a this was a, a hybrid oxide technology structure um, for that IBM was working with. Mike Ribuliuk from East Fishkill brought it to me. Uh, this is polycrystalline silicon at the top, uh, SiO2 at the interface, silicon at the bottom, but this is a 110 interface. And we're looking at a 211 direction. So the, the, the dumbbells in the 211 direction are only 0.78 angstroms apart. And by golly, we could do it. I could, I could get that image and, and measure the dumbbell spacing in the 211 direction, which tells me something about the, the ultimate puck. Uh, uh, size of the probe that I was using here. So given this kind of resolution, you can start looking at, at detail structure at the silicon-silicon dioxide interface. And, and I don't believe we went further with this. So this is all I have to show for that example. And finally, uh, with the misfit dislocation in the, in the, in the germanium-silicon-silicon, well, um, I do indeed can resolve the four column structure of the 90 degree misfit distal partial. Right there. 
Um, it, there is a new one, another nuance though, because as you saw with the gold, the gold atoms, this is not uh, quiescent under the electron beam. The structure does change with time as we, as we get going here. So, so now we finally got to the, to the, the probably the one you wanting to hear about here is the monochromated uh, neon machine at Rutgers. Um, we, this machine was delivered with a nine millivolt uh, zero loss and about a, a one and a half angstrom uh, probe size. And I've got to go really qu quickly now because, that's, because I'm hitting 45 minutes. Um, this is the, the first object that we, that we looked closely at was MGO. Um, and this is what we call a Fuchs Cleaver mode. Uh, sitting on the face of the of the MGO, and this is what we see when we go through the material. You have a longitudinal optical mode and acoustic modes that go all the way down to zero energy. So that's the reason you have a broader peak here than uh, than than when you went than the zero loss. Um, Maureen took the time a month it took him to take a mapping date set of data. We didn't have mapping software at the time. And what you're looking at now is the energy of the mode and the spatial location of the mode for just a rectangle at the edge of the MGO. So at 50 millivolts, that's an acoustic mode. This is a corner mode of surface polariton. And then the face, the face located surface polariton. Then uh, we, uh, we got some of the theory people involved and we get good correspondence of, of the shape of the, of the losses spatially and their energies. And this, this, the, the, the correspondence in energy is telling us that we're not, these modes are not reaching across the, the MGO particle, but they're sensitive to the local structure. And the reason I say that is the model you see is only about four nanometers across, but the specimen, the actual specimen was about a hundred. So, so what we're seeing here is, is actually a, a probe of a local structure. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip through the principle of detailed balance, except to say that if you, if you, if you, uh, if you, compare the energy loss and the energy gain size, uh, sides of the scattering, um, you, you, end up, you can end up with a, you can derive a, a parameter which it depends only on the energy and the, and the temperature. And, and so then you can strike a straight line and get the temperature of an object, but you can also verify the intensity at say at this, between 10 and 20 milli electron volts here, is real phonon scattering, these peaks that you see here. It's not a, a problem with the zero loss. Um, uh, we, we, we got some work out that shows graphically that it doesn't matter what the material is. All you see is the, or the, ge or the, or the geometry of the probe, all, this, all we get is the temperature out when we do this, this measurement. So what I'm after here ultimately is to get uh, 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 an integrated density of states over the Brion zone. So I'm gonna go, I'm just gonna jump through the math and show you what it means to the, to the, to the spectrum. Here's a zero loss and the, and the scattered data normalized to the area of the peaks. So we're normalizing to intensity, do a log, uh, uh, a logarithmic deconvolution here, and the zero loss disappears. Mul any multiple scattering is taken care of out here. Notice we see the asymmetry of the, of the two large peaks. Um, I then remove this energy turn, omega of phonon, and, and that gets rid of the peaks, produces zero here, and we begin to see the energy loss structure of the phonons and the energy gain structure on the left. And then finally, I correct for the occupation statistics and to get a final shape 
for, in this case, silicon carbide. The theory says we got the peak positions right, and for the most part, uh, but the intensities are not good. And we, what we think is going on there has to do with has to to do with the theory, um, and and results for several several types of materials. So I'm going to have to skip quickly through Maureen's most recent result, but but believe me when I when it when I say it relates back to the surface plasmon at the beginning of the talk, because it's got what what it, we've got here. What he, Maureen did is he made he made a coupled aluminum rod silicon dioxide rod structure that gives a, a mode that sits that sits uh, in, in at an energy that is about um, uh, it's it's about 150 uh, milli electron volts but there is a coupling with between the the two rods that reaches almost through to the light line in, in this structure, giving a 26 milli electron volt Rabi splitting. And with a, with a damping, which is about 30 milli electron volts. So this is a competing material for making nano antennas in the IR over something like gold. Um, that's very, very important work. So I'm going to uh, just, just make the observation that that a lot of what we do here has, has we have to worry about the, the electron interacting with the material. We need to worry about the materials interaction back to the electron. And we have to figure out how to parse what are, what are characteristics of the probe and what are characteristics of the specimen. Um, and I'm, and uh, I apologize for not being able to talk about the mini wake. This is this is a plasma. This is a, a single particle wake, hundreds of eV in energy with a wavelength of about a nanometer on a two nanometer particle. This is a calculation at different at times in attoseconds after the electron passing, um, and it allows us also to think through and build um, wake potentials essentially here. Um, for complicated objects derived from data that goes from say a, a millivolt to a kilovolt and display it in terms of 100 femtoseconds, 100 attoseconds out to four picoseconds to say something about how the object is behaving in time. So what I did here was I added, I added experimental data to a photon experimental data to and showing that the 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 100 millivolt result comes out at the picosecond time here and i'm getting and i'm getting lost here maureen's going to be on my case so i have to show you the final slide um, i'd like to i'd like to make the case that Time the time dimension is important and we may actually get to a point where we can, using these kinds of, of patterns, get to a kind of a situation where we can, we can build a model of an excited state in time and in space. Um, and it will, if we can do that, the, it will, the experience that it took to do that relies on these very basic experiments that I've shown you here uh, in, in, uh, in an incomplete way. And I apologize for that, but thank you for your attention.